good morning, everyone. I'm very uh, humbled and honored to open up this uh, session. Um, and I have uh, nothing to disclose. Um, so I think at the heart of the work that I present today and at the heart of the work that interests a lot of people in this room lies this uh, simple statement that if we take enough intertumoral diversity, heterogeneity, apply to it strong selection pressure in the form of effective therapy, <coughs> what we can often get is evolution of disease to a more aggressive and resistant form. We studied this uh, uh, in the past, now branching out to other malignancies, but most of the studies that I would present are there in the context of this one uh, type of leukemia, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Um, and this is a, a, a good place to start studying these questions from the clinical perspective because it epitomizes the challenge that uh, uh, cancer evolution poses to modern oncology. This is a leukemia that we can treat effectively. We have effective therapy that induce deep remissions, and yet the disease almost invariably uh, comes back again. From the research perspective, one of the advantages of this leukemia is that uh, we are able to sample the cancer cells continuously over time directly from the patient's blood with uh, uh, simple blood draws instead of invasive biopsy. And in this sense, you can think about this as sort of the easiest liquid biopsy. And uh, as I'll wrap up, I'll mention again liquid biopsy, but there is this emerging field in, in cancer biology and cancer therapeutics that's dedicated to liquid biopsy. And think of this as the easiest case of that uh, uh, um, uh, phenomena. So the work that I'll, I'll show today is obviously building on a lot of uh, data that has been accumulated in this disease and in other diseases that uh, have shown that what was thought as a monolithic entity, uh, uh, clonal cancers, are actually an admixture of populations that are distinct uh, uh, genetically in other features. And what we added initially to that was to try and see if we can use whole exome sequencing to understand population complexity, clonal complexity within single samples. And we thought that this could help us out because then we can study large cohorts, as I'll, I'll show you uh, briefly. And this was done with Scott Carter at the Broad a few years ago. Uh, you guys have all applied similar approaches uh, since, uh, uh, but what it basically does is it takes the allelic fractions as they come off the sequencers, integrate them with purity and ploidy, and then comes up with the cancer cell fraction, which is the metric we're trying to, uh, um, to measure, and allows us also to classify mutations, somatic mutations, as clonal versus subclonal. Clonal meaning that they're potentially ancestral, or affecting most of the cells in a population versus subclonal that are by definition found in a, in a, a sub uh, a population. And one of the interesting first results was that uh, approximately 50% of the mutations were subclonal. And this is in a type of leukemia that was uh, often thought about as uh, more oligoclonal compared to solid malignancies because of the larger uh, mixing that happens in, in hematological malignancies. Uh, that handle of clonal and subclonal uh, can be used to infer the sequence of genetic events in this process. So, for example, this is from uh, a cohort of 540 uh, uh, samples, patient samples, that we analyze in this way. And what we did here is essentially identify all the recurrent tumor drivers using statistical inference. Many of them have been validated functionally as well. And then rank them by the frequency at which they're found at clonal versus subclonal in the population. And what that translates to is that these 540 uh, cancer samples essentially uh, emulate a, a, a timeline uh, and 450 snapshots along the evolutionary history of the disease. And if a, a driver event appears often as clonal, it means that it's a very early event in disease history. In all of those cases, we find it as clonal versus uh, uh, something is found often subclonal. It means that it occurs later in the disease history. Uh, because we start getting larger and larger data sets, we can find not only uh, um, uh, um, kind of expand on this vision. Um, so this vision uh, assumes a unidimensional temporal axis. But we know that in cancer, there's actually dependencies that would lead from one mutation preferentially to another and so on. Uh, and the, here, because we have such a large data set, we can 
uh, accumulate these pairs of events, one of them showing up as clonal, one of them showing up as subclonal, and that allows us to draw an edge between them, a temporal edge between them, the clonal appearing before the subclonal. If we accumulate all of those edges, we can come up with a map that tells us a little bit about the different trajectories that the cancer can follow in its evolutionary history and can allow us to make inferences directly from the data. Uh, a couple of interesting things is we see that there are two distinct point of uh, the, uh, divert, um, divergent, two distinct point of, of origin, um, and then early convergence towards deletion 11Q, and then significant divergence in late drivers. It also allows us to see, for example, that in a case of a biallelic hit, deletion of ATM and a point mutation in ATM, they actually don't occur at the same time, but follow a trajectory where one precedes the other. And again, this is uh, inferences that are made directly from the data. Um, uh, this type of uh, perspective allows us to follow samples longitudinally to start understanding the relationship between therapy and clonal evolution. Here, for example, if we look at the CCFs at time point one and time point two, you see an example of a leukemia that did not evolve despite three or four years apart versus a leukemia where there is a subclone that grew in size over time. When we look at the uh, leukemias that are untreated in the interval, three to four years between two samples that did not require therapy, they are very quiescent and don't have significant clonal shifts. When we look at leukemias that do require therapy between those two time points, we see that the, the majority of them show evidence of clonal evolution. Um, and that suggests that perhaps our therapies are accelerating this process further. Um, we also wanted to ask whether this kind of a very uh, crude measure of clonal complexity, the presence of a subclonal driver, can be associated with an uh, 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 impact disease outcome. And we found in two independent cohort that indeed the presence of subclonal uh, driver is associated with adverse outcome in this disease. And this has been confirmed since in other malignancies as well. So this perspective can allow us to use whole exome sequencing data, apply to large cohorts, then uh, classify mutations into clonal, subclonal, infer the evolutionary history of the disease, track the clonal evolution longitudinal samples, and then uh, also link them to uh, pr make predictions regarding outcome. And it also allows us to um, uh, start studying this very interesting process in evolutionary biology where you get a cell that was optimized for a multicellular organism and then start this process of uh, losing uh, uh, this dependence, this, you know, the, the, the commitment to the multicellular contract and evolve to something, towards something that resembles more a unicellular life form. Uh, we see the early mutations that are very tissue specific. I didn't have time to get into this. Uh, allowing the cells to compete with the neighboring cells in their own environment. Then uh, later mutations show cancer convergence, convergence across different tumor types. We see increased diversity as the population grows, both genetic and epigenetic. And again, I didn't have time to get into that. And then cancer therapy, interestingly, seems to accelerate this process forward in, in mechanisms that I would get into uh, uh, now. Um, the other uh, observation was that if we study diversity, heterogeneity, before therapy, that can allow us to predict the clinical and perhaps the evolutionary outcome of the disease. So what about relapse disease, uh, the interaction between therapy and evolution? Uh, so we had in, in this uh, recent uh, publication, we uh, looked at 59 patients where we compared the pretreatment and the relapse sample. And what we saw that in all but two uh, uh, patients, the uh, genetic makeup of the disease before and after therapy was significantly different. Uh, and that tells us that clonal evolution with therapy is the rule rather than the exception. Um, uh, and it also uh, uh, prompts a question of what are the quantitative dynamics that allow this process to take place? So if we see that the pretreatment clone is replaced by the relapse clone, what are the quantitative dynamics that allow that to happen? What allows the relapse clone to win the race over the pretreatment clone? And here are a couple of scenarios that we, uh, we uh, postulated. One of them is the one that perhaps comes to mind more naturally to us, the scenario of selective resistance. 
The idea there is that you have a clone that's more resistant to the drug, then it survives the bottleneck better, and that allows it to take over and win the race over the pretreatment clone. Another uh, uh, scenario is where they're actually equally sensitive to the drug, but then one of them is able to grow back faster after therapy. But how can we start distinguishing between those mechanisms directly with, with data? Um, so what we did is we went back to that cohort, those 59 patients that I described where we had the pretreatment and the relapse sample, and then started to tile the interval between those two time points uh, with dense temporal sampling and very deep sequencing. Uh, this required some uh, uh, algorithms to allow us to cluster mutations into distinct uh, subclones uh, to draw out the phylogenies and so forth. But what that del delivers to us is the following. So if the, in, the, in the, that paper we were able only to say that there was a subclone, SF3B1 uh, clone, that grew inside, in size over this time period, uh, now we are able to uh, actually explain how this happened quantitatively. So we see here that, for example, the uh, sensitivity of both of those drugs was actually comparable, sorry, sensitivity to the drug of both of those clones was actually comparable, and what allowed that relapse clone to take over is its ability to grow back faster after therapy. Uh, what that also opens up is the uh, new way of thinking about precision prognostication. If now we can define clones mathematically, then we can perform prognostication by uh, forward extrapolating the growth rate over time and provide accurate uh, uh, predictions regarding clone sizes at a time point in the future. Uh, we expanded this uh, to eight additional patients where the evolution was not driven by TP53, and what we've seen consistently is that they both seem to be equally sensitive to the drug, and what allowed the relapse clone to take over was its ability to grow back faster after therapy. Here's another example, this time with a TP53-driven subclone, a small subclone that increased in size uh, over this time period. What allowed that to happen? Here we see that the uh, sensitivity, as you may predict, the sensitivity of the TP53 mutant clone was lower to the drug. It was more resistant. And that, in conjunction with a slightly higher growth rate, allowed that clone to take over. Um, and that uh, here is consistent across 10 patients where evolution was driven by TP53 mutations, where you see that the log reduction with therapy was lower in the mutant clone and higher uh, uh, and, and there was a slightly higher growth rate as well. And, and I think that's, that's a very interesting phenomenon if we think about how to accelerate our study of new drugs. Because here we have a, a unique opportunity to compare two genotypes against an isogenic background with all the other confounded we usually think about are matched, uh, patient compliance and pharmacodynamics and everything else is matched, and the only difference between this, these two subclones is this genotype. And in this sense, it's a unique opportunity to do what usually we are forced to do either through very large cohort studies or through in vivo studies, <coughs> and to do this directly in patient samples. Uh, notably, we also had a few cases like this that actually showed logistic growth. Uh, so what you see here, uh, or actually don't see here, see here, yes. Uh, you see here that for this clone, the growth rate actually seemed to uh, decrease as the population size increases. And that allows us to start exploring relationships uh, such as environmental constraint directly from patient data. Uh, and those kind of relationships, those type of, uh, the ability to model the growth rate directly from the data had significant impact in other fields such as, as, as viral illnesses and viral therapeutics. And what that can actually show, help us here is to start modeling uh, the therapeutics of this disease uh, while taking into account the fact that these two clones, the more sensitive and the less sensitive, are actually probably competing on some resources. And what that allowed us to do is to do an in silico optimization of the therapy and intuitively what we have showed was that instead of 
just providing the six cycles of chemotherapy consecutively, and a, a more optimized approach would be to space them out, allowing enough of the sensitive clones to stick around so that uh, the, to compete with the resistant clone and not allowing the resistant clone to go from a logistic growth phase to what is more like an exponential growth phase. Um, and that uh, uh, um, would be a potential way to kind of try to think about how to optimize the overall uh, decrease in clonal populations instead of what we do now therapeutically, which we give therapy and it's sort of a whack-a-mole. Uh, we give therapy, we treat one clone, then another clone comes up, we treat that therapy, and so on. Uh, this was in the context of chemoimmunotherapy, but we also wanted to study this in the context of, of targeted therapy, and particularly in this disease, uh, uh, ibrutinib, a new targeted therapy uh, towards um, a key pathway in this disease. So it's not something that targets a particular uh, uh, oncogene, but rather a key identity pathway in CLL. That's the B-cell receptor pathway. This drug uh, targets the <coughs> BTK, which is a uh, critical signal transduction molecule in this pathway, and leads to very significant uh, uh, and, uh, uh, clinical uh, results that have uh, uh, um, brought out the, a, a sea change in therapeutics in this disease, where chemoimmunotherapy has been largely replaced by these targeted therapies. But we see uh, already that some of the relapses contain evidence of clonal evolution where you have resistant variants that are coming up after uh, some time lag. So we try to apply the same type of thinking uh, to this type of question. Um, so here, for example, we look at uh, uh, clonal kinetic with ibrutinib therapy. This is the white blood cell count of this patient, and that provides a measurement of the tumor burden for this patient. So you see here that the patient had a uh, high tumor burden, was treated with this chemoimmunotherapy regimen that I described before, had a prolonged remission, then relapsed, and then was treated with this novel targeted agent, had another remission, and then relapsed again. Uh, we performed whole exome sequencing followed by deep targeted sequencing, and then resolve the phylogenetic tree. What I think is uh, important to note here is that every cycle of remission and relapse is associated with significant clonal evolution. And as a clinician, that's important to uh, consider because if a patient comes to us with relapse disease, we should not use the data that we had previously in the pretreatment setting to guide therapy because likely that's not uh, no longer updated. Another very interesting observation here is actually that we see four sibling clones all coming up with this uh, different somatic mutation in the same resistant-related uh, uh, protein, phospholipase gamma-2, that's immediately downstream of the BTK. So it's, uh, it's a way to kind of circumvent the therapeutic block on this critical uh, signaling pathway, um, and, uh, and we see that actually there's enough diversity in the population to allow four sibling clones to arise concomitantly uh, um, to dominance. Uh, and we made the prediction regarding the sibling status uh, uh, um, uh, algorithmically, but then went and validated it using single cell RNA-seq that indeed confirms that these are um, uh, sibling populations. So I showed you before that we can fit uh, uh, um, uh, a growth rate, uh, a growth pattern to these clones and extrapolate it forward in time uh, for precision prognostication. We can try and use that to optimize therapy. Another thing we can do is once we calculate the growth rates of these um, uh, resistant clones, we can also back extrapolate over time to ask what was the estimated number of resistant cells that were present on the day the patient received the first dose of the drug. And here we come up with, with uh, estimates that, that vary uh, be, between, uh, there were a couple of clones that had an estimates of a frequency of one to 500,000, one to a million. And then we went in with a very uh, sensitive uh, sequencing approach, droplet sequencing, that allows us to screen millions of uh, uh, leukemic cells for very rare events and actually confirmed, validated the predictions we've made regarding the size of the population prior to therapy. 
we wanted to extend these observations to start looking at the early evolutionary landscape of treated CLL. And the idea there is that uh, if those patterns are predictable, uh, when we try to think about optimizing therapy, we start having significant challenges, therapeutic clinical challenges. The current therapeutic paradigm breaks down, uh, and it breaks down for two main reasons. The rate at which we can get readouts regarding efficacy of different targets and matching them with genotypes uh, is very long. It takes a long while to collect this data for this data to mature, and it's not keeping up with therapeutic innovation, pace of therapeutic innovation. Some of these studies take 10 years to mature until you can analyze the data, and by the time you have this result, there's a whole host of new therapeutics that are already introduced to the clinic, and the results are outdated. Um, so, um, so we start, thought about starting to look at these evolutionary dynamics very early in the disease course, and we looked at a cohort of 61 patients treated with ibrutinib in two different uh, early phase two clinical trials, and collected samples at zero, one month, two months, six months, and up to one year. Again, we clustered the mutations uh, into clones such that the uncertainty is reduced by virtue of having multiple clones uh, in further phylogenetic trees. And one of the interesting observations was, although almost all of those patients had uh, uh, very good responses in terms of a decrease in their tumor burden, the decrease was not uniform across the clones in about half of the cases. So in about half of the cases, we see patterns like this, where the, the uh, uniformity and decrease over time is not the same, whereas in the other half, we see things that look like this, where the uniformity is, is fairly well distributed. And interestingly, these patients that had early clonal shift also had adverse clinical outcomes. So despite the fact that this is a relatively small cohort, there's a signal here that shows, and relatively uh, a short follow-up for CLL, there is a signal here that those patients that have early clonal shift actually do worse uh, clinically. Um, this cohort also allowed us to look better at relapse samples. So the, what the data I showed you previously was for the very early treatment period, trying to see if we can look at clonal shifts early on and make predictions. But this is actually looking at the relapse samples. Um, a lot of them showed uh, uh, mutations in known res resistance mechanisms, so we didn't interrogate those further, uh, but other ones didn't. Uh, so here is a, are a few examples. So these actually had mutations in phospholipase gamma 2, but in a site that was not included in targeted sequencing because of how this is kind of, how quickly this is uh, moving to the clinic. So there were earlier reports that the, reported a couple of hotspots in that gene, and the companies quickly uh, generated uh, uh, targeted panels that targeted these hotspots, and then we're missing out on additional hotspots that are not represented. Um, uh, again, so you see here sort of the same uh, 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 way of looking at the data. The ALC is a tumor burden, the clonal fractions, the phylogenetic trees, and the mathematical modeling of the growth rate of different clones. Uh, I, I have a, uh, uh, an emerging sort of uh, uh, enigma that comes out from this data and it also uh, comes out in the field that I don't have a good explanation. Uh, and that we're thinking how to uh, uh, um, explore this further is that oftentimes, as you see in this example, the resistant clone uh, is definitely coming up. It's carrying this mutation in a known resistant protein, but it doesn't explain the full magnitude of the relapse. So we don't necessarily understand the, the full magnitude of what's causing the relapse. It could be that this is non-coding changes and, and we're currently doing whole genome sequencing, or there could be a more complex mechanisms that allows the, this uh, uh, rising clonal population to actually allow uh, uh, sister cells to survive better as well. Uh, we had cases that had uh, uh, mutations that did not involve the BTK phospholipase gamma 2 uh, mutations, for example, uh, deletion 8P, which we previously associated with resistance to this disease. Um, and I think I... Um, and then there's another emerging team with targeted therapy uh, in CLL, which is the uh, transformation that's an emerging theme throughout targeted therapy in cancer. We see it in 
EGFR treated uh, a non-small cell lung cancer, that one of the mechanisms of resistance involved transformation into um, a, a small cell variant. We see it in prostate cancer that's uh, treated with, with antigen deprivation and then transforms into neuroendocrine feeder. So one of the major escape routes for uh, cancers that are challenged with targeted therapies <clears throat> involve transformation to a different cellular phenotype, and that's also true in this disease. When we target the main identity pathway of those B cells, the B cell receptor pathway, some of those cells survive by uh, 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 changing their phenotype into diffuse large B cell lymphoma, a more aggressive, more uh, context or environment independent tumor. And we see this example here. And interestingly, we discovered a uh, 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 mutation in ITPKB, which is on the same pathway, so downstream of phospholipase gamma 2. But this mutation has never been observed in CLL. In contrast, it is observed in DLBCL, in that more aggressive transformed state. And that suggests that there uh, may be an interplay with, between the genetics and the epigenetics, or between the genetics and whatever determines the lineage. And I think kind of more broadly, the impact of, of this type of uh, uh, perspective can help us change uh, precision prognostication uh, to a more quantitative realm based on dynamic instead of static measurements. Instead of just uh, uh, sequencing or genomically characterizing the patient sample at a uh, time point, uh, a given time point, and then projecting all of our predictions based on that single time point, we can now use dynamic information about how different clones are responding to different therapies. Um, and that also potentially could allow us to have closed loop, algorithmically driven uh, cancer therapeutic, where iteratively we can look at the response of different clones and adapt our therapies. Um, and we're very excited also to apply this uh, more broadly uh, outside of the context of leukemia with emerging liquid biopsy technology. And we are applying this to multiple cancer types, so I'll be happy to chat with people later about what we're doing in this field. Uh, but just to um, uh, kind of mention something I'm very excited about is that one of the major challenges in this field is that currently our sensitivity is actually quite poor. So, for example, um, in a landmark uh, study that was published by Charlie Swanton a couple of months ago, where they looked at uh, uh, lung adenocarcinoma, despite using state-of-the-art sequencing, uh, very deep sequencing, targeted patient-specific panels, and so on, um, still they were able to identify cell-free DNA or circling tumor DNA only in 19% of patients that had disease by imaging. So it means that if we want to use liquid biopsy to do things like that, if we want to move from the easiest liquid biopsy in CLL to other solid malignancies, we would need techniques that can carry us to the low, lower tumor uh, burden uh, area so we can study what happens in the nadir, for example. We can study, what, uh, look at uh, minimally residual disease, and we have developed methods that allow us to do exactly that to improve sensitivity by uh, a couple of orders of magnitude. So I'd like to uh, thank many people uh, that contribute to this, uh, folks in my lab, uh, uh, collaborators at Well Cornell um, and at Memorial, uh, Kathy Wu from the Farber, um, uh, Gadi um, uh, Ignati, Scott Carter, um, uh, Victor at the Broad, Matt Novak that helped with the evolutionary modeling, um, our, our, uh, and our uh, many uh, clinical collaborators that provide much more than just samples, but also uh, clinical perspective, biological perspective on this disease. Thank you so much.